tarde, bem-vindos à sessão da tarde deste terceiro dia de Portugal Air Summit. Uma tarde que vai ser dedicada a falar do espaço, mas antes disso deixámos um painel pendente da parte da manhã e portanto, sem mais demoras, rapidamente vamos para o estudo principal falar de imposições na aviação. E para isso, agora vai ter que ser em inglês. So, let's talk about avionics mandates with Chris Ledbury. Welcome to Portugal Air Summit. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, this is the avionics uh, mandate panel. I'm Chris Lebry, head of design of Aeromec in Portugal. Uh, joining me on this panel is Ross Dickey, uh, Universal Avionics. Also is Gonzalo Comtero from TAP Air Portugal. And Major Diogo Duarte from the Portuguese Air Force. Uh, both with the respective fields of avionics and dealing with mandates uh, at this moment in time. So, what do these mandates mean uh, within the current field of civil and military? So we share a common airspace, common mandates, common solutions. The story. As operators, we, I mean, we, we challenge the mandates and the compliance. We have to deal with all the regulatory requirements. It's something that both Uh, our, our panel speakers and the OEM with Ross uh, deal with uh, in an everyday environment. Uh, we share airspace. So we, we, we've got this airspace that we share. Uh, military aircraft flying into civil airspace, uh, so we have to comply with their mandates, and that's what the Major will be dealing with later on in the, in the presentation. Uh, it's at the same, it, it's, it's a common compliance as well because more and more we are complying with EASA through our, our, our military uh, authorities. So this covers both the military and the civil. What we'll cover first is the civil side of it and some of the issues that, that uh, have been about uh, with Gonzalo. So the main thing is discussing the main mandates that we have or we're dealing with uh, at this moment in time. So ADSB out. Now, by the 7th of December 2020, you, the, in the ASRA environment, we have to be compliant, uh, which Gonzalo is dealing with uh, at this moment in time, and, and also uh, the major. Data comms, data comm system with fans, CPDLC, that's another one that's compliant as of the 1st of January 2020. Uh, copy voice recorders in Europe, 1st of January 2021 more applicable to the civil and not the, uh, the military side. What we'll also cover is uh, GDSS, which is flight tracking, which is coming in between 2021 and 2023. Uh, also as part of this panel, Ross will be discussing the uh, implications of LPV. So the ADSB mandate, USA and Europe, in the US, it was the 1st of Jan 2020, Uh, and then it was postponed. Originally it was June uh, the 7th, 2020, and postponed till December the 7th, 2020 in the ASA environment. Uh, so, on dealing with ADSB for a commercial aspect, what, during this whole process of uh, bringing it into your fleet, what How was your, your planning and your process going forward? Thank you, Chris. So okay. first, thank you for the invitation and it's a pleasure to be, to be here discussing this, this subject, which is a, a very, very interesting subject uh, in, our, in our opinion. So uh, as you were saying, the ADSB out mandate, it's something that uh, it, it was keeping us business, uh, busy and it still is keeping us busy to comply with all the requirements of the ADSB out mandate, both the FAA and the EASA uh, uh, regulations. So we, uh, um, in TAP, we had a, a fleet-wide retrofit that we had to conduct. So we, we modified, and we are still uh, in the process of concluding that uh, modification, around 50 aircraft of our fleet. And it was a process that we started early 2017. Okay. Okay. So it's, uh, it seems a long time ago, But actually, it's not. Uh, uh, so it's for this type of retrofits that we need to modify the entire uh, fleet. 
we need to uh, start well in advance for the preparation uh, of all the, the supply chain, getting uh, all the, the, the agreements with the suppliers in order to get all the material, everything we need to start the modification in our fleet. And of course, we need to consider a, a long time for the, the implementation of the modification uh, in, in every single aircraft because we always uh, uh, take the opportunity of heavy maintenance checks. So we don't want to stop an aircraft on purpose just to do this modification. So we take that, that opportunity that the aircraft is out of, of, of service in order to complete these uh, modifications towards the um, compliance with the, with the mandate. So basically, uh, I think our main challenges, as you were uh, asking, so basically uh, were these uh, all these constraints, uh, taking into account the supply chain that we need to have in place, also the, the, the and to fine tune that uh, that uh, uh, those specific uh, issues with the aircraft planning for heavy, heavy maintenance checks. That was a, a big challenge, like it, it always is for a, for a fleet-wide retrofit, and also uh, uh, the. The, the decisions that we had to make, the investment decisions that we had to make, because we in TAP, we are in a, in a process of a fleet renewal. We were in the process of a fleet renewal. Many aircraft coming uh, uh, to our fleet, many new aircraft directly from our supplier, Airbus in our case, coming uh, to our fleet, and then some phasing out. So, and we had to adjust the, our investment decisions based on this plan, planning. Okay. And of course, this adjustment was made still back in 2017 in the context of some regulatory uncertainty because we were still at the time uh, listening very carefully with, to, to, to all the discussions that were being uh, conducted. And at the time, there was still some uncertainty whether the mandate would be further postponed after uh, June uh, 2020. So at the end, we saw the, 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 the deadline that was kept on June 2020, but we have this transition period, as you mentioned in, uh, in, your, in your slide, that we are now taking advantages of to complete with a more, uh, uh, in a more uh, uh, slow pace, the remaining aircraft that we still have to modify. Are just six of them, so, but we still have some time to, to do that. So you'll, you'll plan that over the next, till 2023? Yeah, so, it's so to fit them in during because part of this has to be done during yeah. a large maintenance. So basically, these six that the uh, that that are remaining, if we didn't have this transition period, yeah. we had to stop them on purpose to take them out of the operation to complete the modification. Right. But since we have this possibility now, we will wait for a heavy maintenance check in order to fit there the the modification. So it's always. Uh, a compromise that we want to achieve to uh, use these immobilizations, these opportunities to complete whatever we, we need to. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, Alex explains ADSB is, it, it's got to be, you've got to comply by the uh, 7th of December 2020, but then there's a transition period. As long as uh, certain criteria are put in place and you've got all that planning, the phase is then till. 2023, yes. sorry. and then there's a phase out after that. So it's the, the difficulties that TAP found was everything was planned for the 7th of June this year. Then we've had an extension. The problem is it's not just as simple because you've, you've planned everything in advance. Yes, of course. Starting in 20, 2017, it's not as simple just to change it. Yeah. With the military side, we'll come back to the military side with, with uh, Major Duarte uh, shortly. Uh, but what we've got is... Uh, explaining a bit about uh, the ADSB out and what we've, we, we've, we've covered and it's been an ongoing subject for a, a few years now. So it's a GPS to determine uh, an aircraft location speed and other data. Uh, enhances safety, so that, w that was one of the biggest things it was brought in for. Uh, making an aircraft visible in real time to air traffic uh, control and to the appropriately equipped ADSB aircraft with uh, position and velocity data transmitted every second. Okay, uh, a precise satellite-based SBAS surveillance GPS system, which we've, we've gone in through uh, 
everything on that. Yeah, that specific uh, requirement, if I may, uh, Chris, it's uh, very important for the FAA mandate, yeah. which is a mandate that it's more uh, demanded in terms of the position precision. So that's why we need to comply with the FAA mandate to have a MMR SBAS capable. Because that's uh, based on your operations exactly, and where you operate exactly, your aircraft. Exactly. Yeah, OK. Uh, so w what we'll do is uh, aircraft that require the mode S transponder will need a functioning version 2 uh, ADSBL. Uh, so nearly 80%, if you go by what the stats say, nearly 80% of uh, the fleet should be updated by March 2020. I would say during this current pandemic that may have slipped. Yeah. So that was a, another challenge, let's say, that we had to, to cope with. In, in our case, for the ADSB out mandate, it was not that uh, important because we had everything already prepared, every, everything ready for the, the modifications of the, the aircraft. Yeah. The only impact was that some uh, uh, modifications that were planned during this period were postponed. But since the, the mandate is now uh, due in the December 2020, and since we have the transition period until 2023, it's not an important uh, uh, issue for us. Actually, this uh, pandemic crisis was, didn't have any uh, important impact in the ADSB out compliance. I think one of the things that comes more into uh, the major's point of view, but what, where Aramec found issues with, or not issues with ADSB, is aging aircraft. Mm -hmm. Some of the old systems fitted to aircraft is, sure. when we look at this mandate and we look at what yes. was being offered out there, it was all based around the commercial market. And that's the good point with having the major here is we can then bring a line, older aging aircraft mm -hmm. that still have to fly within a civil airspace. Sure. Uh, so we'll, we'll, just, we'll discuss that after. Uh, the next one, uh, which is another big one for yes. yourselves, is uh, the data comms, uh, the, sorry, the data comms systems and fans, CVDLC. Uh, so the data comm is, is generally a term that is applicable for the growing set of data communication elements in systems. Uh, the goal of data comms is to improve the, the, the safety performance related to communication, navigation surveillance, uh, air traffic, uh, the management, the ATM activities within the operating environment. Uh, so you've been dealing with all this as avionics mm -hmm. and, and part of the DOA, but also implementing uh, all the, the mandates uh, or be part of that team within TAP. What, what issues did you face or mm -hmm. what challenges did you face or, or was it a, the, the CPDLC is actually more of a, and, and the fans is, is, is a, a greater depth of upgrade yeah. than what the ADSB was. Yeah, so, so yeah, for this one, it was, uh, it was different from the ADSB out mandate for a number of reasons. So one of, one of the reasons is exactly what you were uh, mentioning. So because this one, uh, required much more uh, heavy modifications in some of our uh, aircraft. So those older aircraft were uh, uh, not ready for this type of system. So we had to implement uh, uh, heavy modifications uh, uh, in some of them. So it was very uh, uh, time consuming in order to implement those modifications. Just to give, an, uh, give you an idea, we uh, retrofitted around 43 aircraft uh, because of this uh, mandate. And we spent around 10,000 man hours to do all the, the modification. So it was a more, much more heavy uh, uh, mandate to comply with than the ADSB out. Because you started this planning in 2009? Nine, yes. So this one is a long so when story. when the extension came out, yeah. you'd already done all your planning. Yeah. And one of the difficulties that we, 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 we discussed is the phasing in and phasing out of aircraft. So some of the, the updates that you did to were not CVDLC used. are now being phased out. So yeah. I so totally we, agree. So yeah, we started this, uh, the, the, this data link mandate story a long time ago, back in 2009, because at, at the time we were preparing already for the initial deadline of this mandate, which was, which was 2015. But then, because of all the technical issues that uh, uh, in Europe uh, uh, we saw in, the, um, in this data link system, the well-known provider aborts. So uh, it was decided to postpone the mandate to 2020. Uh, 
Yes. And as you said, some of the aircraft that we modified were phased out from our fleet before this date. So it was an investment that was uh, not wasted because then we, wa we used this system for other purposes. It's very useful for other purposes. Yeah. But because of the mandate, we, there was no need to do that. If we knew from the beginning that the 2020 deadline was the one to, to consider. It's so, easier to plan in terms yeah. of the store side of it than you said. I know for a compliance side of it, it's it, it, we're still still dealing with inquiries about this all the time. So it, it's it's a constant, ever-growing thing. And I know uh, that's on 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 a, a commercial side of it, uh, but also on on the military side of it, which we will come to. It's it's still a very big thing that we've still got to comply with. So. Uh, what the key elements with it, I mean, I know you had, a, a, I'm saying, a lot of difficulties. It was the planning and the changing of it yeah. that affected uh, TAP, uh, or didn't, didn't affect, you, you had things in place and then you had to move on yes. uh, and get rid of aircraft. But, I mean, the key elements of, of the data com, CPDLC and the controller pilot data link, communications, video mode two, data link, radios and the appropriate SATCOM. Yeah. Uh, ADSB out or, uh, and fans, uh, ATMB1 domestic operations, ADSC, uh, the automatic dependent surveillance contract required for fans oceanic. Uh, that's something you've yeah, been. So, that actually, this brings us to another interesting discussion around these uh, mandates uh, history because it's we, we as a, a, an international airline, we fly to def different uh, airspaces and we need to take into account the different uh, um, requirements of those airspaces. In this specific data link uh, mandate, we have the European one, which require our uh, aircraft to be fitted with the ATN baseline one compliance system. Yep. But then we operate also in the North Atlantic area. And there we have now, since January 2020, a mandate for uh, funds A plus in our case, which uh, is, we have an Airbus fleet. Yeah. So for some uh, aircraft, we have to comply with both with both mandates. For instance, just to give you an example, our brand new A330 Neo fleet that we phased in last year, most part of the aircraft we phased in last year, we uh, they are not exempted. These these aircraft are not exempted from the European data link mandate. So we need to. Uh, comply with both with the North Atlantic uh, region mandate, which is a, an, a, a, an area where we operate with those A330neos, and also the European mandate. So we had to have the what we call the dual stack solution. And in this case, our supplier was a little bit late on providing a, a, um, a technical uh, uh, solution to comply with these two mandates at the same time. So we phased in some uh, aircraft still not compliant with the European data link mandate. And we had to plan immediately after, before the, the February 2020 deadline for the European data link mandate, the installation of the dual stack solution in retrofit for these brand new aircraft. So we have always these changes, sometimes unexpected, these challenges, sometimes unexpected as it was this one, the, the this nice challenge. mandates that actually aligned. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and not only the mandates are not uh, well aligned, it's sometimes it's also the, the, the technical solution that it's not there when uh, we need it. You need it, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, with uh, carrying on with that, so you've got the NATS mandate phase 2B, uh, flight level 350 to flight level 390, December 2017, which you saying. dealt with. Uh, the FANS man mandate phase 2C, flight level 290 plus, January 2020, you've dealt with them already. Yes. Uh, and then you've got the EU mandate, uh, the LSIR EC 29, 2009, and uh, 201 AS of February 2020. CBDLC will be required to operate above flight level 285 in Europe uh, and flight level uh, 285 plus. So you've dealt with all that side of it as well. Uh, it says, yes, there are exemptions based on aircraft age and passenger capacity. Have you had any exemptions within yeah, so that fleet? I, I was saying, for our A330 new fleet, I, as I was saying, is not exempted. But in the other end, 
our A330CU, so the classic A330s, the, the, are exempted. The original ones, yeah. Because uh, it's part of the, of the exemptions. So if we have uh, a, those aircraft fitted with a FANS A plus system yep. uh, uh, before uh, 2014, it's automatically exempted. So we don't need to comply with those aircrafts with the European data link mandate. Excellent, thank you. So this is one for, for you, you, you're dealing with uh, at, at this moment in time, I believe, yeah, uh, which is the Cockpit Voice Recorder Europe, 1st of January 2021 mandate. So Cockpit Voice Recorders, 25 hours duration aircraft with uh, the uh, MCTOM of more than 25,000 kilograms. You mean take off weight, 60,000 60, pounds. And manufacturers, the 1st of January 2021, minimum CVR recording duration must be 25 hours. Yeah. So you're dealing with that with updates and just replacing all your... No, the, the, this one is, uh, it's not affecting uh, our current fleet. So it's only applicable to line fit uh, aircraft. Uh, yep. So basically what we are doing regarding this specific mandate, it's to together with Airbus to make sure that our uh, aircraft that we still need to receive after 2021, January 2021, yep. are fitted with a compliant uh, system. So okay. basically, it's what we need to do uh, for this one, for this specific one. And that's the same with the tracking. You should already have a solid state. I mean, all CVRs installed on aircraft and helicopters yes. must be replaced with a solid state, which we're all aware yeah, of. Yeah, for that one, um, we had to do some... Uh, some uh, upgrades. Some upgrades, minimum ones, not, nothing compared with the ADS-B and the... No, and it's the only quite, quite, so quite an easy one, that, uh, yes. Quite easy, yeah. Uh, and then the uh, 90 days flight recorder must be uh, compatible with transmitting at least 90 days by July 2018. Yeah, that Is one that? was not... Uh, a challenge for us either because we have the, the, the our components shop has the capacity to perform the, 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 the required upgrades in our CVRs and in our FDRs. So it was uh, all done there in our facilities and it's much easier because all those aspects that I was uh, describing in the ADSB out part, we uh, can eliminate that uh, uh, challenge of the supply chain to send units to be upgraded in the supplier, so we can do that in-house. So okay, brilliant. Uh, Ross, are you there? Do we have Ross? No. Right, so what we're going to cover, I mean, LPV, this was, this was a, uh, uh, a part that Ross was covering, uh, which LPV is, we'll, we'll cover this briefly. Uh, localize, localizer precision and, and, and vertical guidance, also known as pseudo ILS or lookalike ILS, synthetic ILS, uh, which covers the WAS, uh, SBAS. So, uh, there's a link on, on there, which we, if you can, you can email in and we can send you through the link, that will tell you all the uh, LPV uh, applicable uh, airports within and operating zones within, within Europe that we've mm -hmm. got at the moment. Uh, and it's something that we're dealing with, certainly with the, the military side, which we'll go over. Uh, the SBRAS primary benefit LPV approach, uh, localizer performance and vertical guidance, uh, cat one approach, solely uh, reply on satellite navigation. Mm -hmm. and, and I think really, because you're not covering this no. side of it, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll move across to the military side yeah. of it because this is something that is more applicable to uh, the military side. So we, we've got everything to do with, and this yeah. was an overview on this. If I may add just for, for this specific LPV uh, question, so we at TAP as a commercial airline, we are not uh, for the time being considering, the, the, considering this capability. The, yeah because this is more important, let's say, for secondary and tertiary airports. Yeah. Uh, usually we don't operate don't to, deal those, with them. to those yeah. airports. So, so that, this is the, uh, the SBAS LPV Europe PBN uh, implementing rules, establish a mandate for airports and air navigation service providers, localizer performance and vertical guidance LPV, minimum at instrument runway 
was that end of 30 December 2020. Uh, a, a deadline extended the 25th of January 2024 for ILS. Uh, runway that, that ends mm -hmm. so uh, and by the 8th of June 2030 the normal procedures offered to airspace users uh, have to be PBN and then this is just a, a bit of information that Ross was going to cover there we go so talking about the normal cat one and then based on uh, ILS uh, right so the military side I'll put that down Okay. Let me try if uh, I'll pass over to uh, Major Diego Duarte if you would like to cover the mandates. We've, we've mentioned them as a civil side, but now we're going to cover the how you look at it and, and operate it on a military side. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity of addressing this uh, from the military perspective, which, as you mentioned, sometimes is put a little bit aside. And um, us, and as you mentioned, we have to fly in the same airspace with the same regulation that, that the civil side um, also flies in. And with the single European sky, uh, for the, the four regulations that have come up with were addressed by us military, not in the same way as in the civilian side, but with the same perspective. We also try to have the same safety objectives uh, complied. And that, in a military perspective, sometimes is difficult to understand because we're mainly designed for operation. And we tried to address this mandates as if they were fully uh, applicable to, to us. And sometimes the budget uh, was not designed for that. And Fortunately, uh, uh, the SDM and INEA has put up some funding lines, and the Portuguese Air Force took those funding lines as an opportunity to take up this addressing of the EASA mandates, which initially were not uh, um, thought about. And in fact, we, we got some funding on this uh, for three projects, uh, both has common um, projects, pilot common projects for the most relevant, and also for uh, non-priority projects, we, we did also get uh, funding for three specific projects. And the aim of the Portuguese Air Force with this uh, funding, or trying to get this funding, is perform training, uh, military exercises and operations in the same airspace without being restricted, without having restrictions to how we operate. And in fact, it is, uh, for military cases, um, the national military authority responsibility to ensure that the same safety standards are, are achieved. And uh, the Portuguese Air Force, uh, being uh, a, a military operate, operator, is under the Autoridade Aeronáutica Nacional, which is the national military authority, a worthless authority, um, which has this um, obligation to ensure that um, the military aircraft operate to the same standards and define how is compliance achieved. And um, for that, what we, we try to do is certify our systems, our air systems, uh, with the national authority to ensure those same uh, safety standards. And as you mentioned, uh, the big challenge for us is the wide variety of air systems that we operate, most of them being aging aircraft. And we have to address this uh, with care because uh, an aging aircraft, when we modify an aging aircraft, a lot of things come up. There's a lot of things to struggle against like uh, Gonzalo said, um, and we're addressing it uh, for the aging aircraft, the C-130, the Falcon 50, and the, the, um, the Epsilon. Nowadays, through uh, military supplemental type certificates, and we also addressed for the uh, rotorcraft uh, the, the replacement of the old Alouette 3 with a new aircraft, and in, in this new aircraft, we 
are trying to ensure compliance with this uh, mandates. And basically, all the process are, are going through the same three main stages. And dealing with aging aircraft, I think that the most important one would be defining the requirements of what you intend to comply with the change. And also has a TAP, we must deal with operation. So we have, we're restricted to try to have the least downtime possible on aircrafts because we have to ensure the Portuguese state missions and the number of aircraft is not that large. So if we stop an aircraft to do a modification, we have to ensure that this mod goes really fast so that we can continue to maintain our operations. And the difficulty sometimes in defining this mods is the scope because they're old aircraft and what we're trying to do is when we stop one aircraft, try to address the different areas and put it all together because we have one opportunity to go. So we define the, rec uh, the requirements, we contract the modification with the, uh, with the industry and then we do the certification with the PT and MAA uh, and this certification process is what ensures that uh, all aircraft are capable to, to perform to the same safety standards. Um, and even for the rotorcraft situation, which was uh, a, a, a new aircraft, we always tailor design our means. We, we pick up a, a, a civilian helicopter and we try to put it performing military missions. Uh, so we tailor designed it and uh, in the tailored design, in the, this certification process for the military version or military Portuguese version, we are addressing ADSB out, we are addressing um, PBN, also, not because it was supposed to be an IFR helicopter, because it was not, but because the system it, we purchased it with had that capability. And so, uh, what we will do with the AAN is certify it with the AAN to ensure the same safety standards regarding PBN. Uh, for the okay, sorry, for the C-130, um, we we also had to tailor design the the mod, uh, and we 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 picked up. Uh, 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 a flight to avionics and we addressed it uh, with the military uh, care and for some of the, the, the features we for instance ADSB out and and also for the uh, flight tracking we included a feature for on and off uh, um, system whenever we go into a military operation scenario in which uh, a, a civil operation is not possible and in which we want to maintain some um, security uh, levels. Also in the, in the C-130, we addressed PBN. Uh, we did RNAV 10, 5 and 1 for uh, uh, en route and for the approach we went to, uh, down to uh, LAT NAV. Uh, we did not address uh, LPV in this modification with the C-130. But for the case of the um, uh, Falcon 50, we, for the, the, the navigation, we already went down to LPV. Uh, this is a civilian uh, uh, aircraft which is operated as a state aircraft. So it's a civilian type uh, uh, aircraft that's operated as a state aircraft. And with this upgrade, we are addressing it all. We are addressing all the four mandates and with this major change that we're doing to this aircraft, we are going to be able to comply w with all the mandates, which is rather and, and good. the future ones that are coming up, it, it's just a, like a software update, which we discussed with Universal. So, yes, that's, so that's we're, one we're future-proofing that aircraft for the next f true. Uh, few and years. And that's one, one of the advantages, because we can grow from here. So yeah. it's, it's, it's really... And a, that's good a, in a military environment, isn't it? Yeah. So... Yeah. Um, and for, the, for, the, for my last case is the, our 
uh, a legacy trainer and one would, would try to understand why are we addressing the mandates in such uh, an aircraft. And the main purpose is uh, this is a trainer, right? So uh, our, our position is to try to um, get our pilots from the early beginnings to be able to operate and to navigate in the common uh, airspace. So if you're going to have to fly it in the other platforms, we intend to have them flying in the trainers from the beginning. And that's the main purpose of this new um, um, upgrade that we're doing to the trainer uh, uh, for our pilots. And all of these projects go to, through that pro process that I mentioned, which is the certification with the Portuguese National Authority, uh, which has put up uh, recently a, a regulation to show how organizations may apply for a military supplement type certificate and conduct this type of changes and upgrades to military aircraft. And that's a- so Trying to comply a with the civil good. point of view, but also the military point of view on the same airframe. Yes, yeah. both. And across multiple airframes. <laughs> and multiple, yeah. yeah. Okay, brilliant. And, and that I think that's it. Right, the, uh, the last bit we're going to just briefly is GAD's flight tracking update. So to, to make everybody, uh, there's, a, there's a new uh, mandate coming out regarding the MH370 disappearance uh, that we are tracking aircraft. So that was something that we will talk with, well, we won't talk now, that's something that you'll be dealing with uh, moving forward and also possibly on a, on a different level mm -hmm. on the military aircraft as well. True. So, uh, that is the, the next mandate which is uh, that's coming in uh, and it's been delayed uh, to, from, it was from actually January 2021 uh, to January 2023 for new build aircraft. Yeah. We so need an yeah. update. For, for this one, what we are uh, doing now is to comply with, comply with the normal tracking requirements. So we use our AOC, our data link system, actually, yeah. it's another use of the data link system to transmit via AOC the aircraft position every 15 minutes and to track this position on our ground systems. Yeah. So it's... Uh, it's compliant uh, with it. We will comply with the normal tracking part of it, yeah. but for the remaining autonomous distress tracking and so on, it's uh, line fit, as you said, line, and yeah, we, so are, fit at a later date. we are closely monitoring it, but uh, standing by. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's a new one. So this is what it what it covers. So you've got the normal, the abnormal, and then the distress side of it. Uh, and then, so it's the distress, the abnormal and the distress side of it is where we, we need to be focusing on the new ones. This is the, uh, the, the I mean, it's, it, it's the same thing. So as it says there, many countries still haven't set out the national uh, regulations to support its, its one minute standard for autonomous distress operations. So until that is, fully set out this is still uh, an unknown for this this mandate mm -hmm. isn't it yeah of course the oem is already pre preparing for this the airbus yeah. boeing so but it's work in progress uh, and then like i would say very few aviation authorities have adopted it, this into a regulation yet so uh, the, the plan is airbus and boeing uh, have uh, they've been uh, resistant i mean to the original deadline and couldn't modify their line production and incorporate uh, this sort of uh, one-off line solution needed to uh, to assist the the operators out there. Uh, so, what he asks is uh, pressing for uh, six nautical mile accuracy uh, for the location of the uh, accident site, 200 meters, mm -hmm. as well as transmission of of the homing signal for 48 hours. Uh, uh, the, the tracking of uh, degraded conditions present before uh, before the impact, for example, unusual pitch and control attitudes in the case of uh, loss of control, adverse uh, climatic conditions after an explosive decompression or high vibration following the engine failure. They are all bits that we we now have to add into it. And gentlemen, Mr. Duarte, Gonzalez, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for the Portuguese Air Summit. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you.